Telltale Games has, for all intents and purposes, closed their doors and ceased operations. You've probably played at least one of their games released in the past 14 years, whether because you were hunting for Team Fortress 2 item drops, you're a big CSI or Law & Order fan, or you have PlayStation Plus, in which case you might have played Batman, Tales from the Borderlands, Game of Thrones, or any of the many, many games they've released. In fact, there's a good chance that you've played one of their games if you've ever played an episodic adventure game, a genre they commanded such a strong ownership over that these games were often referred to as Telltale-style games. Even when a game doesn't come from Telltale, such as Life is Strange, which I know some people are surprised to learn isn't a Telltale game, it's still referred to as a Telltale-style adventure. Solve puzzles, engage in conversation, make choices, and guide a story through branching paths across multiple episodes. Telltale had such brand recognition in this style of game that they were almost a generic term like aspirin, escalator, dumpster, and velcro. And in fact, their closure doesn't mean that people won't continue to use their name to evoke a certain kind of game experience. Whether you enjoy the Telltale style adventure game or you think their buggy cookie cutter fan bait that relies on popular licenses to push sales, the fact is that they are responsible for bringing episodic games to their current level of acceptance. This wasn't always the case, however. Telltale was founded in 2004 after three of the founding members left LucasArts when the game they were working on was cancelled. Sam and Max Freelance Police was intended to be a sequel to 1993's Sam and Max Hit the Road, and it was the last original adventure game LucasArts would ever work on. Kevin Bruner, Dan Connors, and Troy Molander decided to continue producing adventure games that they wanted to play, rather than make more Star Wars games, and they partnered up with Ira P. Rothkin, an influential technology attorney responsible for assisting other gaming companies with funding, such as Pandemic Studios, ArenaNet, and Nihilistic. Rothkin was instrumental in these early years by negotiating licenses for franchises such as Comic Books Bone and Sam and & Max, and deals with Ubisoft for CSI. Of course, they needed to produce games first, any game, and the first game they released was Telltale Texas Hold'em. And this is also the only game they ever produced that included all original characters instead of licensed characters. A few months later, they would release their first new adventure game, Bone Out from Boneville, and receive middling reviews. This didn't dissuade Telltale, however, and Half a year later, they would release their first episodic game, CSI Three Dimensions of Murder. Sold as a single package by Ubisoft, the game included different episodes players could play through, similar to watching episodes of CSI, with a season-ending episode that would tie the previous ones together in a neat package. This was not Telltale's invention, but rather followed previous iterations of the game produced by other companies. However, it is interesting that the next game Telltale would work on was an episodic adventure game, Sam and Max Save the World. Telltale produced 30 more games after Save the World, and with an exception of only four, and two were sequels. Throughout this period of Telltale's game releases, we start noticing a pattern that would eventually come to dominate their entire brand and arguably lead to their downfall. Bone, out from Boneville, based on the first volume of the Bone comic series, was criticized for its simple gameplay, controls, and short length. Sam and Max Save the World was praised for its humor and graphics and criticized for simple puzzles, controls, and repetitive design, though successful enough that Telltale started to be respected for adventure games. Strong Bad's Cool Game for Attractive People was released in August 2008 to positive reviews, but criticized for lacking ambition and cohesiveness throughout the episodes. 2009's Wallace and Gromit's Grand Adventures had a positive reception, but was criticized for poor voice acting, short length and a lack of compelling side characters. It wasn't until 2009's Tales of Monkey Island that Telltale saw their first serious success, though, with much of the same criticisms. Weak supporting casts, great humor but annoying puzzles, and poor controls. 
That being said, Tales of Monkey Island was a commercial and critical success, mostly because this time Telltale told a cohesive and dramatic story with strong links between episodes, and a focus on character drama over puzzles, partially thanks to Ron Gilbert, one of the original creators of the franchise, coming on board to help write it. This success showed Telltale that strong, story-driven, episodic games could work. Telltale would work on more small titles, releasing CSI Deadly Intent in 2009 with complaints about sameness and a lack of any noticeable changes. In 2010, they released Sam and Max The Devil's Playhouse to complaints about controls, Puzzle Agent to complaints about annoying puzzles and short gameplay, CSI Fatal Conspiracy to complaints about lack of innovation and repetitiveness, and Poker Night at the Inventory to favorable reviews. In 2011, Telltale released Back to to the future, the game, and once again saw significant success. Using voice actors from the movies, licensed likenesses of the actors, and witty dialogue that reminded players strongly of the universe that the game was based in. Essentially a piece of nostalgia that hit perfectly with a lot of players, even as critics called the pacing slow and the side characters bland and cardboard. This success showed Telltale that popular licenses with strong voice actors and attention to in-universe detail would would also work. Seven days after the release of the last episode of Back to the Future, Telltale would release a sequel to Puzzle Agent, Puzzle Agent 2, to generally positive reviews, before releasing Jurassic Park the game a few months later. Jurassic Park was a success commercially, but a failure critically, being panned by critics for forgettable characters, annoying puzzles, and subpar controls, but it was memorable for the fact that it introduced decisions that affect the gameplay and the game's ending, including the ability for the player character to die. Law & Order Legacies was the last game to be released in 2011 to very poor reviews, complaining about short gameplay, aging graphics, bland characters, and a lack of interactivity. 2012 is the year everything changed for Telltale with the release of The Walking Dead. Winner of over 80 Game of the Year awards, selling over 20 million episodes in the first year alone, The Walking Dead put Telltale on the map as a major gaming force. It was called a revitalization of the adventure game, being praised for taking all of the experiences from previous games and expanding on them, while also fixing the common Telltale problems by having even stronger writing, with Walking Dead creator Robert Kirkman helping out. And and high quality voice acting. This was a strong, story driven episodic adventure with a popular license, strong voice actors, attention to in universe detail, and personal feeling decisions that affect the gameplay and the game's ending, including the ability for characters to die. It sold over a million copies in the first month, and was lauded for being as good in the middle as it was at the end. The Walking Dead Season 1 is a game that is talked about often, and even we have included it in several videos, such as our video on the impact of emotional games. To this day, I consider this to be one of the most emotionally impacting titles I've ever played. This was also the last time that Telltale would release a game that was this well-regarded or this profitable. In fact, while we are currently only in the early days of Telltale's collapse and closure, there are already rumors from former insiders that suggest this was actually the last game Telltale produced that drove any profit at all. The Walking Dead was a watershed moment for Telltale in more ways than just their reputation, and unfortunately not all of them were good, but we can take a moment and appreciate what they achieved that was worthy of praise. Perhaps today, in the shadow of a licensed title like Marvel's Spider-Man, it's not completely outrageous that a licensed game would win Game of the Year, but at the time, Batman's Arkham series had only just started, and Alien's Colonial Marines was still selling pre-orders. The gaming industry at the time was not particularly Hollywood, and it would have been difficult to imagine a series of licensed games based on HBO shows and blockbuster movies being released as adventure games from a single publisher. Certainly the idea of a licensed adventure game winning Game of the Year from almost 100 different sources in the same year that Mass Effect 3, Diablo 3, Far Cry 3, and Dishonored also released, and nearly 20 years after 
the last LucasArts adventure game, was a surprise and a shock not only to the industry, but also to Telltale themselves. Telltale did not release another game in 2012, and did not release any game until midway through 2013 when they released Poker Night 2, a reasonably well-regarded game from their experimental team. This was the last non-episodic game they would ever release. The next few years were a whirlwind of releases from The Wolf Among Us, Tales from the Borderlands, Game of Thrones, two seasons of Minecraft Story Mode, three more Walking Dead seasons, two Batman seasons, and Guardians of the Galaxy, the Telltale series. When the studio was shuttered, they were working on a final Walking Dead season, and the second second seasons of The Wolf Among Us and Game of Thrones, as well as an untitled Stranger Things game. But the problems from their earlier games would reappear in each season. Cardboard characters, poor controls, aging graphics, bugs, and unconnected, poorly written stories. Telltale started to produce games that were seemingly identical, except with some minor plot changes and different artwork often failing to innovate in any way at all except to double down on hoping they would land the next Walking Dead, but seemingly without any understanding of what made Walking Dead Season 1 so good. So let's step backwards to the period of time immediately after The Walking Dead was released. Season 1 was, by all accounts, primarily led by two of Telltale's lead developers, Sean Vanneman and Jake Rodkin. According to sources interviewed after the fact, the reason why The Walking Dead Season 1 was so different from every other game is because Jurassic Park had done so poorly in sales that they simply had to get a game out. Now this might sound like an odd situation, why would rushing a game out produce a better game? And the answer is because upper management couldn't force changes. And so Vanneman and Rodkin were able to exert their own influence over the game, innovating and creating a new Telltale style without the Telltale management being able to forcibly change it without causing so much time waste they would go bankrupt. Of course, once Season 1 sold so well, management had room to breathe and therefore would never allow this kind of creative freedom again. Telltale began hiring and expanding, growing from a company of around 100 employees to almost 400 in a few months. They inked deals for more licensed titles and began managing multiple projects and multiple teams at the same time. However, as with any small group that suddenly grows, the internal dynamics of the company changed drastically. No longer did you know everyone you worked with, but you might not recognize anyone at all. There was no detailed documentation process and communication between teams was nearly impossible. While this is a growing pain that many companies are able to eventually solve and stabilize, Telltale was also experiencing loss of key members of their staff. Vanneman and Rodkin both left Telltale, forming their own studio, Campo Santo, and developing a game called Firewatch. Firewatch was tremendously successful. Not long afterwards, lead writer Adam Hines would also leave and form Night School Studio, producing Oxenfree, which was also very successful. Writer Chuck Jordan quit, lead designer Dave Grossman and scriptwriter Michael Stemmel left, and four other writers, directors, and producers from The Walking Dead left to join Ubisoft. In fact, Telltale experienced such an incredible amount of talent loss that it was claimed there was no creative torch at Telltale. And at this point, Telltale becomes the story of Kevin Bruner. One of the co-founders, lead programmers, and Telltale CTO, Bruner was the major creative force behind Telltale. He was instrumental in developing the Telltale Tool, the engine and design tool used to create almost every game they made. But, despite the success the company he co-founded was experiencing, he was jealous and upset at the fame others were receiving for what he considered to be Telltale's game, not Vanneman and Rodkin's game. After The Walking Dead, he stepped into a much more central creative role, and when these creative members of the team left and started successful careers outside of Telltale, Brunner did not appreciate it. He felt they were taking advantage of the spotlight put on them because of his game produced at his game company, and they didn't deserve that. If anyone did, it was him. So, Brunner refused to give credit to anyone for their creative vision. They might leave and become a competitor. Unsurprisingly, this sent many staff members running, but those who stayed witnessed his tightening grip everywhere. 
According to a very in-depth piece by The Verge, there was a dark period of time where if you were in charge of a project, you are not getting any interviews, one source said. He's going to be the one on the panel. He's going to be the one doing the interviews. He's going to be the one in the magazine. Former employees were consistent in describing Bruner as a creative bottleneck, micromanaging development from pitch to final product. The Verge details further how he would personally rewrite tutorial text, wanting to be consulted on everything from the color of the walls to who they've hired to write specific dialogue. At this point, it's unsurprising that Bruner also took over the role of CEO. And with complete control, he began to require every single project to be tailored specifically to his tastes exclusively. No other opinions were allowed, no creativity, no innovation outside of what Bruner wanted to see. He kept trying to beat The Walking Dead, and while many employees say that his intuition and creative direction was actually not completely off, his personality was toxic. Telltale's former employees detail incredibly harsh reviews and a culture of screaming and cursing in meetings, leading to an incredible burnout rate. And while the management was fickle and toxic, the work environment was in a state of near-permanent crunch time. Reports of non-stop 100-hour weeks and 20-hour days in an attempt to take the schematic of The Walking Dead and force it on every single license they could get their hands on. For two years, Bruner clamped down on innovation and creativity to the point that Telltale's games were all the same game, with different art and some different voices, until one day he was fired and walked out of the building. Telltale would replace him with Pete Hawley, former general manager of Zynga. Two months later, Holly would lay off 25% of the company, though most of the employees blamed Bruner's inept leadership for placing Holly in a position where he had no other choices. But not to be outdone, Bruner would, one year later, reinstate himself into the spotlight by suing that company for firing him. Sadly, Telltale would never recoup from the period of time that Bruner was the CEO. When a final deal with Netflix for the Stranger Things game fell through, their funds disappeared, leading them to cancel the last games they were producing, lay off the remaining employees, and keep a 25-person skeleton crew to finish Minecraft Story Mode due to contract requirements with Netflix. Today, the story of Telltale is being spread across Twitter, from stories about how people were laid off without notice or severance, to stories about employees hired as early as a week before the company closed, and worse still, employees hired recently who moved across the country to work for Telltale. Accusations are being thrown at everyone, from Bruner to the fact that the Telltale tool was designed in 2005 and used in every single game, to YouTubers for showing hours-long walkthrough with zero commentary, giving you the whole experience without paying a dime. Gamers are mad because The Walking Dead's final season was only released a month ago and will never be completed, even though Telltale charged full price for it. No one is happy about the ending of Telltale's story. After investing several years into Telltale's stories, both the gamers who played them and the developers who made them are entitled to their anger at what can be seen as a poorly managed company destroyed from within by jealousy and stubbornness. An industry icon that will be forever marred by how they died instead of what they accomplished. Bruner, within a few hours of the announcement, released his own statement on the closing of Telltale, including his take on how he built a brand and defined a genre, and talking about his passion for games and how he managed to avoid layoffs. But the final sentence in his statement rings more as a hopeful wish that I can completely stand behind. I want to once again highly recommend you read the introspective done by The Verge from March of 2018, which goes over the period of time after The Walking Dead and up to just after Bruner was removed from the company for a more detailed look at the specifics. I am personally grateful to that article in specific for the incredibly helpful in-depth look at that period of time in Telltale's history. In fact, all of the sources linked in the description are interesting reads about what will go down as a tragic failure in gaming history, 
If you did enjoy this video, I would very much appreciate it if you would share it with others on Facebook or Twitter. As a small content creator, we cannot easily combat the YouTube algorithm. It relies very highly on videos being shared, so if you like this, please share it. If you didn't like it, then don't, but if you did, you can watch another one in the corner right now, and as always, we'll see you on the next one.